I mean, they, they go into the sun, it's not a problem, but they need some place to kind of have a break. There's a kind of fallacy here in Africa, is with overgrazing, is people tend to destock. And if you think of the millions and millions of animals that were here in southern Africa a hundred years ago, it's, it's completely wrong. It's that one of the reasons we're actually desertifying so fast is that we've removed animals, ironically. So the kind of conventional perspective on it is that we destock, destock, destock because the felt is degrading. But in fact, it's the other way around, is we need more careful management of the stock to rehabilitate the land. This is especially on your extensive dry land areas. Here's a bit different because it's so much wetter. Yeah. There's a thing issue with pH uh, with cattle, is if you have very acid conditions, statistically you tend to get more bull calves. Once you move your conditions to a slightly more alkaline, neutral situation, statistically you tend to get more female calves. How do you do that? It's, it's, well, one of the reasons is the management of your felt, is if you've got a healthy felt, is your pH will naturally move more towards neutral. Um, it'll be more in balance. Whereas often the extremely acid conditions, although you do have, I must, obviously some natural conditions that would tend to favor acid conditions, but, uh, you know, you would generally, as your felt improves, move to a more balanced situation. It's far, it's far from ideal. Basically, there should be no space at all between the plants. This is the clover here. This clover. Which is nitrogen fixing. This converts atmospheric nitrogen into living nitrogen or organic nitrogen. Very certainly a very significant proportion of electricity went into converting atmospheric nitrogen into nitrate fertilizers. And if you consider that we have a whole range of plants that would convert nitrogen into living nitrogen for free, it's a kind of, it's a, like if you like, it's a budgeting issue, energy budgeting completely wrong is that all that electricity is being drained off to make nitrogen. It's also the issue that most of that nitrogen was used to make explosives, which is highly controversial in itself. But it's just a complete waste of energy and electricity when there's so many different plants that can just convert it for free. And quite a lot of work has gone into it, as they say, certainly I know from upcountry, is 40 large acacia trees can produce the same amount of nitrogen as your recommended applications from your commercial sector. So, as I I think it's a controversial issue. It, it's a whole very complex chain reaction. I mean, in this country it would be certainly coal-fired, and then that's carbon dioxide emissions, and uh, you also then using, which a concept in, in holistic management, your mineral dollars is non-renewable resources, whereas this form of nitrogen fixation is totally renewable. It just requires on the solar, and in fact they have a lovely concept in holistic management. They call these solar dollars. You're generating from the sun a resource which uh, you could consider as a solar dollar. I think it's a very nice concept actually, a solar dollar. The worst thing for any piece of ground is one animal the whole time taking little nibbles, little nibbles, little nibbles from the felt is Alan Savory's come up with a concept of donkey days. And one donkey can cause far more damage, as I say, if it's left permanently on a piece of ground, than 2,000 animals on that same piece of ground for, say, five minutes. I mean, I've actually seen a farmer doing that where he had 2,000 head in an acre of ground, but they were only there for five minutes. And this was in a dry area, and after a period of this kind of management, his grass was much tighter spacing than we even see here in this high rainfall area. And the life that had come back into that soil was tremendous. His following the animals were a flock of guinea fowl, starlings, and the animals, wild animals, would follow the cattle and have wonderful grazing. And we say the danger is, is one animal just picking away, picking away, picking away, picking away and would you definitely start getting overgrazing? Is that the grass never has a chance to recover? As soon as it shoots, the animal nibbles. 
So you find the roots of the plants start degenerating and the spacing between the plants then gets further and further apart. And if it were to persist for any length of time, you end up with a desert. So the idea of growing between the vines is to provide a cover for the soil, to prevent soil erosion and to in, in, improve the condition of the soil. What's usually used are your grasses, grass family, like um, triticale is the one that's used commonly in a lot of vineyards now. There was triticale here. But definitely if you protect the soil on the surface and increase the soil organic matter, is you, you're basically benefiting your grapes in the long run. I think there's a lot, very exciting potential and certainly in your old areas in Italy and Greece is the farmers use the space between the vines for a lot of different crops. So I think in the long term what we would be looking at is once we get the condition of the soil up is producing much more if you're in demand plants between the vines. I said at the moment we're fairly early stages of sort of trying to improve the condition of the soil. Obviously also here it would be in the winter that we'd be mainly growing between the vines. We're using totally biodynamic techniques in this uh, vineyard. Um, what they do is they are quite regularly sprayed with compost tea, which uh, feeds the plant, but also is used for controlling pests as it creates um, the right kind of pH condition to give the plant resistance to fungus diseases. Um, so there's no chemical inputs at all here in the vineyard. Um, we use a lot of thick mulch and when compost is available we try and get compost down onto the vines. But what we're using primarily is a compost tea. So at the moment they've been spread twice a week with compost tea, both for disease control and also for the nutrients of the vines. At the moment we've started some traps um, using pheromones. Um, for example, we've got around, we've seen on some of the olive trees, the millibug. So we've put up a millibug trap just slightly higher up here in the vineyard to monitor and see what uh, kind of levels of infestation are here. And uh, should there be a serious infestation, we would be using completely organic methods of control. Like probably for mealybug, we would use a, a natural plant oil that forms an emulsion and we would be spraying that if, if the infection reached a critical level. But I think that's very unlikely. We could also use the traps that we've got in larger number. And the way the trap works is it uh, consists of the pheromone, which is a chemical substance produced by the insects that attracts the insects. And so the insect is attracted into the trap and at the base of the trap is a sticky pad and so the insect gets stuck. So we could be using the traps as well if we get fairly low levels of infection. This is one of the traps. It's brilliant. Okay, so the tiny little guys there are the mealybugs. The, the little capsule in the middle contains the pheromone, which is what's attracting these insects. So that's come from the research, is it's a natural product. Well certainly the ants, what the ants do is feed on the secretions from the mealybug. And I think some people would be correct in saying is the ants actually farm the mealybugs and milk them. So it's a bit like an ant dairy farm. Is they milking literally the mealybug and feeding on the secretions from the mealybug. Mealybug has a very poor digestive system so what it is excreting is very high in nutrients and the ants are then feeding on that. And it's, it's a very similar thing to the aphid. In fact ants definitely farm the aphids. Is they will often actually put aphids on a tender growing plant and wait for the aphids to suck the juices of the plant and then they would feed what they call honeydew which is basically aphid uh, secretions. I wanted to do, I loved the kind of idea of a natural kind of garden, especially growing up in uh, Zimbabwe. You, everything was very natural, the fantastic insects and birds. So I've always sort of looked at trying to create a situation where you have that natural environment. And one day a guy was doing some research in Zimbabwe and he was trying to get permaculture started off, this is John Wilson in Zimbabwe, 
And he arrived in my garden and he said, this is permaculture. And I said, well, what the heck is permaculture? And he said, this is permaculture. So I was no wiser and then he left me a whole lot of books. And really from that point, that was, if you like, the beginning of the Denai Training Center in Zimbabwe. It's, uh, I immediately recognized looking at the books that uh, here was a system that I, I was interested in pursuing. We decided to work together and set up the training center outside Harare which was to pioneer permaculture in Zimbabwe and to try and take it to the people of Zimbabwe. And I think it's still operating from what I gather. That is a testimony, although they're working away, for hundreds of years of poor farming. Like the amount of soil being lost from there for hundreds of years, I'd say a hundred years, soil has been pouring off that shoulder there. So you're down to subsoil. And really a lot of Southern Africa is like that is uh, unfortunately our farming practices instead of building up the soil has worked in reverse and uh, so there's been tremendous soil loss leaching so that soil is now very poor it takes uh, like a minimum of five years to work some to get something and even that that's only to get a kind of shift back um, sometimes a bit quicker is animals would play a very vital role in recycling material and getting the natural cycles going. So there would be a role. There are also other interventions with planting, but I think that would need to be done in combination with the um, animals. It's generally animals create, the animal impact would create more favorable conditions to re-establish plants. In terms of the plants that are there, one can, I think once your conditions are there, certainly the use of leguminous plants, a lot of le tough leguminous plants, I think what you'd find is, given the chance, a lot of the natural fenbos would actually already just take hold of itself anyway. And thereafter it would be a situation of managing that uh, kind of felt carefully. On that kind of tough piece of ground, I would imagine you'd be having to use things like goats um, to just get things recycled. Goats have always been considered to be the scourge of Africa because they take out the roots. I think that's, it's the poor management of goats that is the scourge of Africa and in fact I think really the first phrase there is the key issue is either if you like a lack of management or poor management is a far more critical issue than the goats themselves. The goats are merely a scapegoat. <laughs> I mean it's true they are really a scapegoat. Um, and I think this is a, there's a tendency like on that is to point fingers at other things without looking at ourselves often and seeing that maybe we are the ones at fault in terms of our management. I think one would have to have develop a system there where obviously the goats are moved. You'd need to have a high impact on a small area for a short period of time to give them time to, if you like, bring down certain things and to create a cover. What can be done there is also by feeding them, throwing in litter and organic matter into that intense area and then moving on step by step by step around your land until you've got an upliftment in your kind of conditions and natural cycles operating again. Extensive. So it starts here, comes around, and then we have a more formal walled garden down below. It's used in the preparations. Exotic plant, yarrow. But it's a very, very useful plant. So it's used um, in the biodynamic preparations. That's actually quite a long and complicated story, the use of it in its preparation, which uh, we could spend probably half an hour talking about. But just from a layman's point of view, it has a couple of very, very important uses. You can see that it forms a lovely, great cover. So it's a very, very good ground cover plant. And it uh, has a reputation of, if you like, softening the effect of drought. And I'm sure a lot of that is to do with its ground cover um, effect. The flowers also attract a lot of more beneficial insects, especially your wasps. In a garden situation, wasps are a gardener's good friend, rather like an earthworm. Because what the wasp does is it parasitizes a lot of the pests, particularly ca caterpillars, also a number of the different flies. So. A wasp is a very handy thing. It has a number of other uses. It's used to treat kidney complaints in the herbal medicine. Um, and it's a great 
I love it for a garden is if ever you get a cut or a bleeding nose and you just crush the leaves and put it on and within seconds your bleeding is stopped. It was used to treat Achilles tendon. It, its botanic name is Achillea, named after Achilles. And a, an old name for it as well was Soldier's Wart. There's a lot of folklore with this plant. This ground had been very compacted during the winter and a bit waterlogged. So we've dug in a lot of compost on a technique that's called double digging. So we allow the air, you can see that it's raised. The other name for it is a raised bed. It's to allow the soil to breathe now. Also we've added a good amount of compost into here so we've enriched it with humus. What we've done initially here is uh, we've put in some lettuces and you can see as I'm going now we're going to be adding leeks here this afternoon. I may add we've still got a bit of weeding. What would happen with these weeds is they'd be put on the side and used as a ground cover. So one of the other things here is to put plants that benefit each other. Lettuces are generally very light feeders and I think a very useful plant is that they're very fast it's a term for it in a sense is a catch crop whereas we would have here leeks that would take a longer time to mature so that means you're making good use of your ground is you're getting a harvest and then allowing your slightly heavier feeding leeks to take over on the long term also they have the benefits of what it's what we call companion planting is that often they these would help to keep the soil cool for the leeks to give them good growing conditions and the pungent odor of the leeks would also tend to benefit and keep away pests from the lettuces. A classic combination of basil and tomato. These were only planted yesterday. We still need to do a bit of weeding with parsley. So there's a definite linkage here is that your basil produces oils and scents that would keep pests away from your tomatoes. Tomato is also a strong scented plant. What's very difficult to see at this stage now is the use of space. Is your tomatoes are going to be becoming very tall, your basil is more bushy, and then on the edge of your bed you would tend to use a small compact plant. What's That's, that one? This is actually parsley. This is becoming increasingly difficult to get good pure seed actually. Um, because the Multi the seed companies have such a stranglehold over the seed production it is very very difficult to get what they call the open pollinated or your older varieties so I mean obviously what we're going to be doing in the long term is looking at c keeping as much of our own seed as we possibly can maybe one of the things in uh, organic gardening is being able to instead of just randomly clearing an area is as you're weeding recognize what plants are there and basically those plants would be telling a story is the type of plant there tells you a lot about the condition of the soil and often very useful plants also would be emerging through and is rather to manage them carefully than to just do a kind of clean sweep um, weeding and removal of them so obviously a sunflower is not only an attractive plant it's also a productive plant What's the point of weeding it when you can actually get something that's not going to cause any harm there at all? Tracks and would be attracting insects, beneficial insects, to your garden. Right. right. Composting is the business end of any organic farm and is an extremely important process. Here on this farm we're actually practicing biodynamics, so it would have an increased importance. And it's probably the most important process here. We've now busy collected up. For our compost, we tend to favor cow manure as the best ingredient for making the compost. But we've gathered together a variety of different organic material. Here you have the cleanings from the cow stall, which is enriched in cow urine and manure, and that would be going into the heap. We've got from our, a nearby farm, we've managed to get some straight cow manure just to supplement our limited supplies. The rest of the material is all collected around the farm. So any weedings from the garden that we would get would come into the compost. In making a good compost heap, one, it's quite helpful to consider it almost as a, a, a creature in itself. So one is really building up a creature here. So one has a breathing down the central as we pack 
very loose material so that the air can get in and it's a, a critical process in making good compost is to get enough air circulation also to have the right and certainly at this time of year the requirement of watering everything in so that all the material is nice and wet if, if material is too dry one tends to get an unfavorable kind of breakdown process and less humic acid which is really what you're after so what we'll be doing is putting layers of different material we'll be following here with some green garden waste and building up the heat to about one and a half meters okay so although it would be here it's quite loosely packed now one of the specific things about bi which makes biodynamic compost a bit different from the others is that we would be using special preparations and adding these in there would be seven different preparations that each of them would bring in certain enhancing uh, processes into the compost heap. Can you name them? Well, they, they're designated with numbers, so 501, 502, up to 507. So some would be to enhance the calcium process, okay, so the assimilation of calcium. Some would be to, uh, like the silica, to bring light into the compost material. Others are to give it uh, like we talked on yarrow, yarrow is one of the preparations. That's the one that's used to bring in the light process. Okay, so that you, it's like bringing light down into the soil. The compost here would be used to make compost tea. And the way we do that is use, we have a large tank and we take about a wheelbarrow load of good humus and it's put into the tank and filled up and then stirred, what we call dynamizing it, is it's aerated. So it follows a aeration process for 18 hours. So this, in a sense, activates the whole mixture. And then the following morning it would be sprayed, primarily in the vineyards, but we'll also be using it in the garden areas and in the fruit, for fruit trees. The beans are great nitrogen fixers. So the idea is to fix nitrogen, we would obviously get a harvest, but this would be fixing nitrogen and for the maize, which is a very greedy nitrogen plant. The plants next door are eggplant brinjols. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your companion planting them with? We haven't yet got a companion in here, what has, hasn't emerged. Recently will it be beans here again. And the Japanese are very discern discerning uh, consumers. And a Japanese person can taste a chemical product and a natural product. I'm trying to think of the word that they have uh, to describe it. I think what's important though is that they are a very, very discerning consumer. And just from taste and smell they can discern a pumped up, commercially, chemically produced vegetable and fruit from one that is grown naturally. And there's actually a huge potential growing market in the East for good, healthy, organic food. We in the West are way behind in terms of our discernment of tastes and real quality on food. I certainly sometimes can taste like, like tomatoes are particularly, I think, one of the most striking things, is you buy a tomato and it smells absolutely ghastly. Now, unfortunately, what's happened now with pest control is they have developed poisons that they call systemic poisons that fill all the tissues of the plant and the fruit and they tend to linger and if you like they have the property of sticking to the cells of the plant now i think these chemicals are particularly dangerous because if you start eating them they stick to your system and infiltrate your whole system 